Want to learn more about mini splits? Want to learn how they work? What tools you need to be able to troubleshoot mini splits in the field? Today you're watching HVAC Tips for Technicians. I'm Tad and I'm going to be teaching you everything I know about mini splits, how they work, the components, and also how to troubleshoot. This was a highly requested video. I took a poll about a week ago and gave all you viewers a few choices of what I could do content on and this was the number one choice. So I'm doing this video for you today. I really appreciate you. Before we start, hit that like button. Hit the bell, ding, so you know what I'm doing and do not forget to subscribe. Really appreciate all my viewers, my subscribers, and definitely my members. And before we end the video, I have to tell you I have a guide that can help you in the field understand more about mini splits and also how to troubleshoot resistance tables. If you need this, click the join button, go down in the comments, let me know I joined. I'll give you my email, that'll lead to my contact. Let's go ahead and get started. If you're watching HVAC Tips for Technicians, I'm Tad. Let's learn more about mini splits. First, we're going to go over all the components. I've got the outer panels taken off for the outdoor unit and also for the indoor wall mount air handler. So let's go over all those components. It took me literally five minutes to get these panels off to show you the internal components. And all I needed to do that was a Phillips screwdriver. So this right here is my Phillips bit for my drill. Easy peasy. These are the screws that held all those panels on the outdoor unit. This right here is the outdoor unit. And the first thing I want to show you is the motors. Now, each motor is BLDC, so it's brushless, digitally commutated. I'm going to explain how that all works and how this system operates. But first, let's go over the components. Now, this is a sound blanket, and this is to deaden the sound of the compressor, although it's very small and it runs pretty quietly. This is a rotary compressor. So this is an inverter rotary compressor. This right here is the accumulator, and this is standard so that you don't have liquid flood back to the compressor. Anytime you replace a compressor like this, you have the accumulator attached to it so that you get a new accumulator with the compressor. This right here is the reactor, and this smooths out any fluctuations in voltage, prevents over trips of voltage, and the reason that you have this reactor that looks like a transformer is because it is for a longer lifespan, more reliability for that VFD, that main PCB board that has the inverter inside of it. So you wanna make sure you have good power factor correction. That's why you have this reactor. Now we have a four-way valve. This four-way valve, unlike most residential equipment, has a 240 volt coil. So you don't have 24 volts going to that valve. You have 240 volts, 220 volts going to that valve. Now. Let's check out the EEV. This is the EEV valve, controls the amount of refrigerant that goes to this indoor heat exchanger. This right here is the valve body. This is the electromagnetic coil and the stepper motor, okay? So this right here is the stepper motor. It goes from zero to 480 steps. Now let's go over the main board. This is the main PCB, has an inverter board built in, and it also has a heat sink. And that heat sink is right here. And that is so that when the fan is passing across that heat sink, it helps to cool that board down because we don't want to need that board getting too hot. And that's also why underneath this board, you have thermal paste, okay, connected to the board. And I've got a video on that. You should check that out. There's more videos on my playlist. Let's go over sensors. We've got an outdoor ambient sensor. We've got a outdoor coil sensor. And then we've got a discharge temperature sensor. This discharge temperature sensor is a 200 kilo ohm sensor. It's connected to the discharge line and measures the temperature. And then the coil sensor, as well as the ambient sensor are 10 kilo ohm sensors. So anytime you're checking with a meter, you wanna switch your meter to kilo ohms. This is the outdoor fan motor. This outdoor fan motor is BLDC, just like the compressor, just like this indoor fan motor. That is brushly, brush, sorry, brushless, digitally commutated, okay? We're going to talk about how that motor works in conjunction with that inverter board, but let's keep continuing on with parts. This right here is a 12-volt DC stepper motor, and this controls the vein opening and closing. This right here is the receiver. Your remote points towards this receiver and it receives the communication from the remote controller, from the transmitter. 
And then this right here goes to the indoor board. This is your main indoor PCB for this indoor wall mount air handler. Now, you've got a few sensors here. This right here is your evaporator inlet and outlet or mid and out uh, sensors for the evaporator. And then you've also got a sensor that measures the air. And that is right here on the side. I'm gonna show you that right now. This is right here, is the indoor ambient air sensor. These three sensors for this equipment are all 10 kilo ohm. So every sensor for this Samsung heat pump, every sensor is 10 kilo ohm except for this discharge sensor. And if you wanna learn more about how to check resistance using the charts, I've got a video on that. You should check that out. I've actually got a video, I think it was E320, where we had an OLP and a discharge sensor that were possibly faulty, and I show you how to check resistances. So I've also got a video on how to check motor resistances, but this is the components that comprise this equipment. We've got our F1 and F2, which is our communication in from the outdoor to the indoor equipment. This is our L1 and L2. This is where our main power supply comes in. And then from that term, those two terminals, you will go to your indoor equipment and then you'll put those two terminals here. Forgot to take this panel off, need to take this off so you can see those connections. Now that we've went over all the components, we're gonna go over how it works and what tools we need. So for gauges, you need an adapter to be able to hook up to the service port or the Schrader port. This right here is a 5 16 adapter that I use and I connect this usually to my red hose and I measure with my high side. Sometimes when you're installing this equipment, you need to actually put nitrogen in well above 500 PSIG so that you can test and make sure you have no leaks in your flare connections. So you'll need that 5 16 adapter. Link in the description for that. You will need some sort of thermistor sensor to measure the air temperature split, okay? So this right here is a type of thermistor that you can use, and you can actually plug this right into your meter right here, okay? And you can switch it to temperature. I'm also using an SC440. So I, I measure temperature split. You don't know how to do that. I've got a video on that. Also, you will need meter leads that are super, super small. Why do you need that? Because a lot of these connectors, Molex connectors, going to the sensors are really, really small. So you'll need these fine, tiny, thin points to be able to make the proper resistance reading. So you'll need those smaller leads. You will need an adjustable wrench or a pair of adjustable pliers to be able to take your flare connections off. I definitely recommend that you don't use adjustable pliers, that you use that crescent. And this right here is where we're gonna hook our gauge hose, that little adapter to. And you can see it's a little bit larger than a standard connection for a residential um, package unit or split air conditioner, not these ductless units. So that's the tools you need besides this right here, Phillips bit for my drill. I like to use that, it's just so much quicker. Also, I took the panel off so you can see the indoor air handlers communication connections f1 and f2 they're polarity sensitive so be careful do not hook f1 and f2 hook f1 to black and then inside or the outdoor unit hook up red to black do not do that because then you're going to end up with an issue never hook line voltage to this communication otherwise you're going to blow your pcb your pba this right here is your line voltage coming from the outdoor equipment to the indoor equipment let's go over how this equipment works now and then we're gonna go over how I use the tools to be able to troubleshoot and then what types of scenarios I run into with mini splits in the field. So we have this transmitter here and we input the mode selection and the set point temperature and we send that signal to the indoor unit. The indoor unit receives the signal and then it starts to pulsate that EEV valve as well as the compressor and the outdoor fan, the indoor fan based off of the sensors measuring temperature on that heat exchanger that I showed you on the indoor unit and also the ambient air. So it's sending pulses, signals to the EEV valve to open or close it based off of the measurement in temperature. And you wanna maintain a certain target superheat, so you wanna maintain a good steady flow of refrigerant to the indoor unit. 
Now, for the compressor, the indoor fan, the outdoor fans, we have got a inverter board that basically simulates an AC sine wave because you have a rectifier in this unit that changes the AC input voltage, 220 volts, to a DC voltage, and then it outputs that, okay, by switching this switch called an IGBT. It's an insulated gate bipolar transistor. And depending on how many times that switches, okay, will depend on how much current flows to the indoor, outdoor, and compressor. And you're basically using that inverter as a VFD, a variable frequency drive, to change the frequency or the hertz of the motors. So you're adjusting the RPM up and down. What you want to do is you want to maintain, or the process, the algorithm, wants to maintain not only a target, good target superheat, so the indoor unit has plenty of refrigerant, but it also wants to maintain a good compressor discharge temperature. So that algorithm has a certain amount of processes. So you could be pushing the button here, sending the signal, and then it's ramping up and it's holding for a certain amount of period, whether it's 60, 90 seconds, and it's measuring all those temperatures, and as those values change, it either ramps that motor up or it ramps that motor down. And that is the basic operation of this equipment. All those BLDC motors, those brushless, digitally commutated motors, the VFD is changing the frequency and the hurt of those motors. So let's go into how do we troubleshoot this type of equipment with the tools that I've shown you that I use in the field. Let's get to that. First, to test the remote controller, if you're using a wireless remote controller, take your camera and when you push a button, you should see a light. Let me show you. See that light? Okay. That means that our remote controller is working. Now, let's check the sensor. So you get your meter. This right here is where the sensors plug into this board right here. And I've got it out. We've got three sensors. We've got our ambient our discharge and our coil sensor and we're going to have our skinny leads here and we set our meter to ohms and then we check each sensor let me show you when you're checking those indoor and outdoor sensors it's great to have a chart that shows you the resistance at what temperature so that you know if it's 70 degrees outside and you're checking the outdoor ambient you know this right here should be the ohm value. So checking our sensors is really easy. We're going to check the first sensor right here, which is going to be our ambient sensor, and it's 19.11, if you can see that right there. Checking our next sensor, this right here is our discharge sensor, and it's a 200 kilo ohm sensor, and you can see it's measuring 365. Going to our next sensor, we have our coil sensor, and it's measuring 18.81. So you can see those are reading in the 10 kilo ohms and then the discharge sensor is reading in the 200 kilo ohm. Now we're gonna use our meter to test the EEV valves coil, that electromagnetic coil. We're looking for somewhere around 42, 43, and we're gonna disconnect that Molex plug there. You can see that Molex plug right there, right? I'm gonna take my camera and Move it down so you can see it. Now we're going to be checking from the blue wire to the black wire, blue wire to the yellow wire, blue wire to the red. You get the rest. So from blue to black, should have around 42, 43. There's 42. All right, let's measure to the yellow wire, 41. And then blue to red, 41. Super easy. See that? That is how to test that EEV valve. You want more information on that? I've got a video on how to check that EEV valve and error codes. Now, this right here is the plug for the outdoor fan. Now, there's a certain resistance you're supposed to read on this, and you have to have the resistance tables, but if you have a motor problem and you disconnect this motor's Molex plug from the board, and then everything starts uh, communicating properly again, you may have a bad motor. Unless you have the correct charts to look at for your resistances and your voltages, you're gonna have a hard time being able to figure out which wires to check and what you're supposed to read. So I'm gonna take a moment and show you this chart here, red to black, motor, power, supply, voltage, see that? White to black, yellow to black, blue to black, and this is for indoor and outdoor fan motor voltages, and then, 
you have this right here, which is a basically a little chart guide that shows you fan motor ohms, fan motor part number. On that motor, you're gonna have a part number, and then you've got model number of your unit. I'm gonna show you something pretty awesome here. This is a way to get a part number. This is the part number here, DB3100642A of that motor. It was the outdoor motor. How do I know that? I'll show you. BLDC and 31, okay, how did I find this? You scroll up, shows you an exploded parts view. You have the model number of that unit, one and a half ton. And then right there is 31. You know that's the outdoor fan motor. So how do we get this exploded parts view? We get that from samsunghvac.com. See exploded parts view. I clicked right there. You can get the service manual. That's why I love this website. Super awesome tool. You can use this in the field. Look it up mobily. All right, so I just want to show you this because unless you have these charts, then you're going to have a hard time figuring out what to check. So this is a guide. I can send this to you. Just uh, click the join button. Go down in the comment section. Tell me you joined. Now we're going to check the windings of the compressor. I've got the plug leading from the inverter board to the compressor. Unplugged here. I've got my larger meter leads. And all the windings should read the exact same, and it should be less than two ohms. So we're gonna measure from red to blue, 1.7. We're gonna measure from red to yellow, 1.7, and then from yellow to blue, 1.7. So all those read the same. Now we're gonna measure from uh, the shell of the compressor right here to each winding and make sure that we don't have any resistance readings, otherwise it is shorted to ground. So the shell of the compressor, not reading anything. All right, and that's how you check the compressor. It's three phase, so all the windings should be the exact same. All right, now, when we have line voltage coming into the equipment, you should be setting your meter to volts AC. When you're measuring the communication, you should have it on volts DC. And to measure the communication when the equipment is on, you would go F1 and F2, and you would have uh, communication voltage from 0.5 to 0.7 volts DC, and it would be moving constantly, fluctuating constantly. If you're measuring the volts AC, your line voltage, you should have a steady voltage. It should be around 208, 230, whatever voltage you're working with. Now, for measuring the sensors for the indoor unit, same thing. You unplug that Molex plug. These are 10 kilo ohm sensors, so you would be measuring somewhere around 18, 19.00 just like the sensors for the outdoor ambient and the coil sensor for the outdoor unit you want to see me do that check out some other videos i've got some videos on how to do that now this is your indoor motor plug okay and then this is the power coming into the board now on the indoor motor there it's a bldc motor it's three phase i'm going to show you some resistance tables so that you can better understand when you're checking that out if you're using your remote controller, you know the batteries are good and you don't have any power to this board, you don't have any display, you might need to check your power incoming to this air handler. If you've got power coming in to the line voltage, then you could have a fuse that's bad. There is a thermal fuse on this equipment and it could be blown. I've had indoor fan motors that the bearings were bad, the motor was shorted, and it blew the fuse for the indoor PCB. So that's something you can run into. Let's talk about po possible scenarios. We've went over just about everything when it comes to troubleshooting this equipment, how to use your meter. Let's talk about different scenarios I run into in the field, and then we'll close out today's video. Let's go over pressures. What do you see in the field as far as pressures for cooling versus heating? This is 410A equipment, so typical pressures for cooling and where you hook your gauge up. Let's go back over that. So I've got my gauge hooked up, my hose hooked up to my adapter, my 5 16 adapter, and then to my vapor connection. This right here is my service valve, and this is the vapor connection. You can see there's no connection for the liquid service valve, okay? 
So I'm only able to hook up to this suction service valve port and that's okay. I usually use my red hose and I hook it up to my high side gauge. So in cooling, when this unit's operating and it's you know 95 degrees outside and you've got, depending on your indoor and outdoor temperature, this is going to be different but I'm gonna give you a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is when it's in cooling, fans on high speed, you should see around 125, and that can be upwards of 150. Just depends on your conditions. But I would say at least 100 if it's 95 degrees outside, maybe 125, maybe 150. I've never seen over that. So yeah, that should give you a good idea. And if we were using the low side gauge, 125 is right there. That's what you're gonna see. Now, in the heating operation, in the cooling operation, the outdoor unit doesn't run for the first three to five minutes. The indoor fan runs, okay? And then during the heating operation, the outdoor equipment runs, but the indoor fan doesn't run. Can you guess why? So that the outdoor unit can run, get the indoor heat exchanger up to 99 degrees temperature. That way you don't have a cool draft, okay? So during the heating operation, I've seen this gauge be 300, 400 at the most. But in between three and 400 is what you should have. You turn it on heating, you got 200, you feel this vapor port and this vapor line, you're probably not gonna have any warm, hot line. I've seen this temperature get upwards of 150, 180. It gets so hot you can't touch it and you're gonna experience pressures around 300 to 400, okay? So you wanna make sure that you have those type of pressures. If you don't, then you could end up having a low refrigerant issue. And we're gonna talk about that next. You never know what you'll run into. Got this unit running and heating. High side hose, gauge hooked up, got the 5 16 adapter. This should be upwards of 300. It's only 200. Let me go inside and show you what's happening. Got the cover off of the indoor wall mount air handler. And we've got a leak right here. See? I'm gonna order the indoor coil. Should be under warranty. The most common problem in the field with these mini splits or these ductless units is low refrigerant. And the reason being is because most people that install this equipment do not take the necessary precautions to make sure that they have a good install, and that means no leaks. They don't put nitrogen in the equipment and nitrogen pressure tests with 500 pounds and make sure they do a good leak search before they start the equipment, before they pump it down and they fill it with refrigerant. Usually these units come factory charged, and if you want to charge a mini split, you usually have to recover all the refrigerant that's in the mini split before you charge it. And when you charge it, you have to factory charge it. When you come to a piece of equipment and it's in cooling and it's only at 50 PSIG, if you try to add some refrigerant and there's a problem, then you might be able to find out if it's low of refrigerant. I don't suggest just adding refrigerant, but sometimes it may be the process that you need to take, the steps you need to take for you to be able to figure out if it is just low of refrigerant. Because of course, if you're using a dual induct psychrometer like I showed you earlier, and you're measuring a temperature split, if you add refrigerant in the cooling mode and your temperature split's only 10 degrees from return to supply, then you add refrigerant and then it's 15 or 20, then you can know, hey, it was just refrigerant that was low. Again, 90% of these units are installed incorrectly in the field and refrigerant leaks is one of the number one problems that I find in the field. But what are other things that I find? Some things that I find is bad compressor making a really unusual noise, making a very loud noise, making it uh, like a ticking noise. I've been able to find compressors bad. The first sign was an obvious noise. So that's something you might find. Something that's great about mini splits is the fact that they have error codes. And I'm gonna show you a sheet here in a minute and give you typical error codes. But error codes are great because not only do they show you where the problem is, but that's something that you can check first. Now, one thing you need to know is there's a process, there's an order of operations. You need to be able to use your meter, check line voltage first, 
check see if your fans are turning if they're not turning there could be a problem there you need to use the order of operations but also you need to know that there's error codes not only are those error codes displayed on the indoor air handlers in a form of an E101 or E201 they can be displayed on the outdoor unit they can have LEDs that show you and then a diagram that shows you what LED means what so do not be blind to the fact that you have error codes that can lead you in the right direction and then you don't have to guess at what's wrong with the equipment. Error codes are great. Error code definitions table. And there are quite a few. Now, one other thing I run into is communication wires chewed in half. I've ran into communication wires that were spliced. I've ran into communication wires where we had an animal outside that chewed the wire in half and all I did was re-splice the wire back and now the equipment's running. So that's a problem that I've ran into and it's great. Also, you can have... Also, something obvious, indoor coils dirty, indoor blower wheels dirty, your outdoor coils dirty. It could be dirty. That could, all, that could be the only problem with it. Let's talk about some obvious maintenance related issues. So if you ever have a wall mount air handler and water's pouring down the wall, then this means that the drain needs to be cleaned. That means that the drain is probably stopped up. It's very easy to remedy this situation. All you have to have is a vacuum and you can be able to suck that drain out and then the water will come out the drain, leave that pan and no longer pour down the wall. Something else you can run into is a blower wheel that's dirty causing the fan motor to not pass enough air or it causes the fan motor bearings to go out. You can have an indoor or an outdoor coil that's dirty and also a filter that's dirty. Something that I love about Samsung units is they have a CF on the indoor units display and that CF means clean filter. And sometimes I'll enter a, a control space, a room with this wall mount air handler and you can actually hear the air, an air pattern, the, the change of the sound will let you know that, hey, the filter needs to be clean. So maintenance, these are some issues you can run into. Maintenance, a lack of maintenance. And that's something that can stop the unit from operating correctly, and then there you go. Something else that can happen is you could have ice covering the outdoor equipment. Maybe there is a, a awning or a roof that is really close to the outdoor unit and the ice and the snow basically falls on the outdoor unit and it's no longer able to defrost. What you want to do is you probably want to shut the equipment down and make it to where there's either something over the equipment that doesn't get that ice to fall on it. That's, that's you know. So something I've ran into in the field is I've had the equipment turned in the heating operation but it doesn't blow any heat, it stays in the cooling operation. And I've had to check the indoor sensors and the indoor ambient sensor was the problem the whole entire time. I've got a video on me checking sensors, you need to check it out. It shows you how a sensor can be off and the equipment will throw an error code or the equipment just won't work properly. So having bad sensors, I've had that in the field and it's probably one of the maybe second or third things that I've had the most problems with. Number one is definitely maintenance. Number two is uh, improper installation. And then number three is maybe a bad sensor. So uh, not a lot of problems you have with mini splits just because they're so small and they're so easily, easy to keep clean. So I haven't had a lot of issues with um, different like components. I've had some power surges take out some inverter boards. I've had inverter boards that were installed in equipment, but there wasn't a lot of thermal paste on the board, so the board burned up, it got too hot. You need to make sure that if you change an inverter board that you have thermal paste. I actually have a video on putting thermal paste on a board. For your multi-zone equipment, you have an outdoor manifold, and that manifold has more than just one connection because you have more than one indoor unit. You have several EEV valves, and one thing that can happen is it's not addressed properly. It's very easy to remedy this situation. You may have an E199, you may have a 108, and all you have to do is push the K1 button, and you're gonna have a symbol that kinda looks like this, and it's going to run the unit, and it's going to open the valves, and it's gonna test, and it's gonna address, 
It's a great auto address feature. I love it. So you could have that issue, especially upon a new install. On residential equipment, the EEV valves are actually located in the outdoor unit. On commercial equipment, the EEV valves are located sometimes in the indoor equipment. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Hope you learned something. Definitely leave those questions in the comment. If you have a question, that can lead to more content. And let me know what you learned. Let me know who you are, where you're from down in the comment section. If you need help, click that join button. Do not forget to subscribe. Hit the like button, the bell, ding, so you know what I'm doing in the future. And I really appreciate you guys watching. I'm Tad. You've been watching HVAC Tips for Technicians. And I'll keep you cool if you let me.